Good morning, friends. I greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who is the one that has set us free, and He has set us free indeed. Amen. It is good to just chat with you again this morning, to be with you, um, although it might be over a distance. I think we slowly but surely are getting sort of accustomed to the fact that we mostly have to get together as God's people. And although we do it separate in our homes, that, and yet we do it together as the people of God. And I pray that you are keeping well, that you are keeping warm, and that you're also keeping safe. Um, I know that there's a lot of fear at the moment running around because of all the infections uh, with the schools that is closing. And um, we, we understand everything that's happening. But we also need to be in a place where we just rest in, in God's peace, in the comfort that He gives us, knowing that He is in charge and that He will take us through to the other side of wherever the other side might be. And so I pray that as I share the message with you today, that you will come to a clearer understanding of what it means for us to be called sons and daughters of God, that you will know that you are a child of God. So we begin by praying together. Oh yes, Father God, we want to thank you for the opportunity of worship, for the freedom to be amongst your family, even though we meet separate and yet we are together in the warmth of your embrace. We thank you, Lord, that during this time we can put aside the uncertainties of this world and rest upon the certainties of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that your promises are not changeable as those of people might be, but, it, but they are immovable and eternal. Yes, Lord, thank you that we can bring to your feet all the hurts and the fears that trouble us and that we can leave them there, knowing that your strength and assurance are all that we require. We thank you, Lord, that as we draw near in worship, that we will be transported from a world of concerns and fears to a place where we can be at peace in your presence, where we can find healing, wholeness and refreshment. So we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you have given us this morning. We also come to you, I want to say, Lord, thank you, that as we come to you as a creator, the sustainer of the, the world and everything that we see and everything that's unseen, that we also know that we come to a holy God. And Lord, that we can come with forgiveness to you, with repentance, and knowing, Lord, that we leave a lot of things undone, we do things that we should not be doing. And yet, Lord, in your grace and your mercy, you allow us to come to you, to repent with you. And then, Lord, know that we can leave and, and go back to our lives with the freedom that you have given us through the forgiveness of Christ, through what Christ has done for us on the cross. And thank you, Lord, that your word says that as far as the east is from the west, so far you have removed our sins from us. Although we may be as red as scarlet, you will wash us as white as snow. So we thank you, Lord, that you will forgive us and continue to forgive us. We do know the joy, Lord, of walking in that forgiveness on a daily basis. So we also come and we pray, Lord, for those that are going through difficult times in this moment. Lord, where they are living with illness, Lord, where we have this virus that's also a possibility. Many people know people that has got this virus or had it. And Lord, we, we just praise and thank you that we know that even with this virus around us, that you are much bigger than this and that you will take us through and that we will come out on the other side, better and stronger people, people that believe and trust in you. And Lord, like your disciples in the boat that, that were scared while you were sleeping, help us to know that you are not sleeping at this moment. 
Lord, that you are in control of everything, that you know what is going to happen. And Lord, that you are waiting for us, not just waiting for us on the other side, but that you are walking with us through this time. So Lord, be with us. Be with our loved ones. Be with our friends. Be with those that we care for and those that care for us. And so we thank you, Lord, that we can pray these things, not because we deserve it, not because we earn it, but because of your great love for us. And we pray this, Lord, in his mighty name, through the power of Holy Spirit. Amen. Isn't it good to know that 
we can bring all our problems and issues to a loving Father and that He will continue to, to listen to us and that He will always be there for us. And so, as I come this morning, you would have noticed that I didn't read a scripture as such. I want to deal with Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 39, but I will deal with the like in in, in sections with some verses. Um, I have just felt that as, as as we work through this passage, that it might be a good way of looking at this passage. So in Romans 8, 26 to 27, we read the following. Romans 8, 26 to 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. You see, Paul urges us to not be too concerned about how we pray. I believe many times we use words willy-nilly, and we think we can impress God with our words. Jesus again used an example of the Pharisees that stood on the street corners and used wordy language in their prayers to impress the passers-by. He then states that prayer is to be that moment where you know you are dependent on, on God and, and, and a God that knows what you need long before you are aware of it. I think Paul is taking the closet image and putting us in a place we might not need words even to express ourselves to God verbally. It is Holy Spirit that lives within us, that knows what we need clearly. It is Holy Spirit that then intercedes for us to God. And this intercession by Holy Spirit is always in line with God's will. And therefore we will be recipients of the right solution or need according to God's will. If we do not have this understanding then we will mostly be disappointed when we do receive an answer from God or a solution is presented that is completely opposite to our expectation. John Stott, in his commentary on Romans, writes, Three persons are involved in our praying. First, we ourselves, in our weakness, do not know what to pray for. Secondly, the indwelling Spirit helps us by interceding for us and through us with speechless groans, but according to God's will. Thirdly, God the Father, who both searches our hearts and knows the Spirit's mind, hears and answers accordingly. You see, friends, if God, and if God answers our prayers according to this, He will then... Romans 8, 28 And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to his purpose. In the verses before verse 26, Paul dealt with a lot of issues regarding the problems we might face in this world and, and the world's own groaning to be released from the curse on it. Which brings me to this question, why do we suffer? You see, it is an age-old question asked by many people of faith and no faith alike. This question is mostly used as a reason by those that want to deny God or kicking against belief in Jesus Christ the Savior. The bottom line for us as humans is that whatever we believe is right or wrong concerning suffering is that we need to admit that as humans we are the reason there is suffering. It all goes back to the fall in the Garden of Eden and suffering was and will be part of our lives till that day that Jesus comes to restore earth to his glorious form that God intended for it in the first place. In Luke 13, the disciples told Jesus of some Galileans who were killed and their blood were mixed with sacrifices by Pilate. Now Jesus' answer alludes to the fact that the disciples had something in mind about people that went through that kind of situation and they were not as good as other people. Jesus' answer deals with the fact that things happen and people are either in those things or not. It is not whether you are a bad person or a good person, and accordingly, bad or good will happen to you. Jesus states the parable of the fig tree, and he says that the bad people will experience 
will be on the day of judgment when he comes to look for fruit from the people he died for. Till that day we are living in a world where good and bad happen to both good and bad people. And although we have something with us that screams against this, we need to make sure that when injustice happens to whomever, that we deal with it in such a way that we do not show preference to one person over another. The bottom line for us as believers is that no matter what happens in this world to us, that God can use all of that and make it come together for good. This is a fundamental belief that we need to cling to, that God is good in store for us regardless of how bad things might be. When we are on a trip somewhere, we only see the road that's ahead of us. We only see the destination once we arrive and realize that whatever has happened on the road is nothing in comparison to where we are in that moment. And in the end, God's purpose is for, is for us to be like His Son, our Savior Jesus. Romans 8, 29-30 For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. These verses caused many problems in the past and probably will cause more in the future because of the words Paul used here. The problem is that we tend to look at the single word and not in the context with other words. It is like the allegation that C.J. Langenwerfen once said that half the parliament are donkeys. He was immediately asked to retract his statement. He did that by stating that half of the parliament were not donkeys. <laughs> it was accepted and the proceedings went ahead. The issue was that all those people in Parliament heard was the not in his second statement, but they did not look deeper into the words in the sentence to actually realize what he said in that moment. In the same way, we get caught up with predestination if we only focus on that word. But in relation to the other words in that sentence, it basically comes down to the fact that God foreknew that people would believe in Christ. And those he has predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. The predestination is that it is God's will that those that believe in Jesus will become brothers and sisters of Jesus. The fact is Jesus died for all people and to believe in him is available to all people. There is no predestination of who will believe and who will not. God knows who will believe and who not but He still extends His love and grace to all people. Only those that believe in Jesus are predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ, which leaves us with the understanding that regardless of how good or bad a person is, without Christ there is no claim to son or daughtership in God's family. Paul says that once a person moves on the path of belief, God takes an active role in the process of the moving the person from where they are to full glorification into the likeness of His Son, which will take place at Christ's return. This then brings us to the next verses. Romans 8, 33-34 Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Paul feels very strongly that God, who did not need to, sent his only son Jesus to die on a cross so that we can have a restored relationship with him. And if he was prepared to send his son to go through all of that, how much more will God not be prepared to give us what we need in this life? Paul is very clear that it's not about our wants, but our needs. God knows what we need. And most of the times it is entirely opposite to what we want in our situations. Paul declares the character, character of God as one that is prepared to sacrifice on our behalf and then also willing to help us with the same sacrificial attitude. Plain and simply because of Jesus Christ and what he has done and is doing. Most of the times we do not understand the how and the why but we need to believe that God, it is God's will to give us not just Christ, but all that we need to live in a relationship with Him and our fellow humans. And so, 
if we are in this amazing sacrificial relationship from God's side. Romans 8, 35-37 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul just reiterates his statement from verse 1 in the same chapter with the issue of no condemnation if we are in Christ. He maybe takes it a bit further that it is not just our position in Christ that frees us from condemnation, but it is also Christ's position with the Father. And we can know that Christ's intercession together with Holy Spirit's intercession will accomplish the will of God in our lives. You see, friends, we need to sort out in our lives the issue of guilt once and for all. It is when we like, it is when, you see, friends, we need to sort out in our lives the issue of guilt once and for all. It is like when we drive in our cars and we see a traffic officer. We might be traveling at or under the speed limit. And yet we slow down some more. The guilt that we feel in that moment is not the same guilt as when we actually do travel faster than the limit. This guilt is the kind of guilt we put onto ourselves or is put onto us by Satan or by people that wants us to make feel bad about our belief. In the end we can do nothing about this guilt except reject it for what it is, a false accusation. The guilt that we need to deal with is the one where we know what we do is not right according to God's will. And that includes traveling over the speed limit for no good reason, if ever there was one. We need to approach our Father and confess our guilt, repent and receive His acceptance of us as sons and daughters, loved by a never-ending, all-encompassing love. And this love is the best thing we can and will experience in our lives. And therefore, we can know. Romans 8, 35-37 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. In our relationship with God, through Jesus Christ, we can know that nothing in all of this world will ever be able to separate us from God as our Father. It is the life of Christ that is our motivation, our reason for living lives that give glory to God. Here we come back to the issue that we are not people working for God's approval by being good people. We are good people because of God's approval of us through the love of Christ in which we believe. It is through our acceptance of Christ's love for us and the subsequent sacrifice of his death on our behalf that makes separation impossible. It is through Christ's love and death and life that we are more than conquerors. The problem is that for a conqueror to feel like a conqueror, they need to conquer continuously. I've practiced that quite a few times, and I got that right. The thing is, through Christ's love, we do not need to have this desire but rest in the fact that He has conquered death and sin, and that we just need to rest in our son and daughtership in relation with Him. And so we do not need to conquer anything anymore. And when we do, we can declare with Paul. Romans 8, 38-39 For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, Neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These words, friends, say it all. I pray and hope that you will take this and make it the glue that holds your relationship with Christ, with Holy Spirit, and with God as your Father. It is when we cling to these words, although we might not always understand it properly, that the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, will be part of our lives, even in times like we are facing at this moment. Friends, I pray that you will know that you are a son or a daughter of God our Father, that you are a brother or a sister with Christ, 
and that we have Holy Spirit within us as a seal to confirm all these facts. Friends, instead of a prayer, I will play a video with some truths from Scripture. Basically, you'll see in the first slide it's asked the question, Who am I in Christ? And then the Scriptures with the statements are made. And I would ask that during the time that this video is playing, that you use these lines as your prayer, that you would pray those lines as prayer to God and just let Him cement in you the fact that He loves you, that He cares for you, that you are His son and that you are His daughter. Friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.
It is 